Welcome back to Beyond the Helmet. That's hashtag BTHPod if you're following on social media. I'm your host, Steve McGrath, and man, today I have a very special guest. It is none other than a member of the Penn State Board of Trustees. You might see him on Nittany Game Week if you're a big Penn State fan, but it is none other than Jay Paterno. Jay, how are you doing this morning? Doing great. How about you? I'm doing phenomenal. I, I appreciate you taking the time. Um, I, I would imagine as someone that is so heavily involved in the Penn State community, you could be a little distracted. There might be a pretty important game around the corner. Um, you know, two years ago, I went to the whiteout when Michigan came in. It was a phenomenal game, the best football atmosphere I'd ever been a part of. But this feels like it could even be bigger than that, even if it's an away game. As someone that just clearly has your finger on the pulse of Penn State football, how do you feel going into number three, Iowa? Um, you know, like some point Monday afternoon, I was doing stuff for the show and I'm like, God, it's still Monday. I mean, it's just one of those weeks that it doesn't seem like you ever get to the game itself. There's so much yapping and everything. When I was coaching, you loved games like this, uh, but you hated all the ancillary, you know, the constant talking and media and, all, and the demands on your time could be distracting. But, you know, this game is going to be interesting because I'm not sure, you know, till you're about seven or eight weeks in the season, nobody's really sure who's good and who's not. And, you know, the, the Wisconsin, you know, to be in a season, if you had said we were five and oh, you'd be really happy, obviously at Penn state, but the, the Wisconsin win isn't quite what we thought it was now. Um, the Auburn win looks, looks really good. And the Indiana before the season thought Indiana would be really good. And they're obviously struggling. So some of the games you thought, um, you know, and, and I don't think everybody thought Iowa would be the number three team in the country at this point. So uh, I'm, I'm antsy to see how good we are, how good Iowa is. And uh, I think it sets up well with Penn State going out there. Um, they've been on the road to Wisconsin already this year, so it's not going to be a shock to them. But Iowa is a very, very tricky place to play. So two quick questions then, you know, one, what does Penn State need to do in order to leave Kinnick with a win? But also, you know, if you were coaching right now, what do you do for the guys to get their mind right that, yes, it's number three, yes, it's on the road, it's early in the season, we don't really, like, how do you just sort of make sure that that locker room is ready to go? Well, I think if you keep, if you stay on an even keel for every game, you know, you pre prepare the same way. You don't go, you know, one of the biggest mistakes I think guys make when they're young coaches is they, when they get a game like this, they build it up and build it up to where the point is, um, you know, it's all or nothing, or it puts them on edge. Like this is suddenly something different. Uh, my freshman year at Penn State, we played Miami uh, in the national championship game with the NBA 86 season. It was one versus two. It was the, still the highest rated uh, football broadcast in history at a 25-0 rating. Um, and it was humongous. It was all these things going, all this hype. And uh, the last day we, we were at a practice and Joe said, ah, they're ready, forget about it. And none of the coaches completely said, look, if we build this up too much, it creates these unrealistic, that we've got to play a perfect game. We've got to do all these things. He said, he said, let them relax. And the team was relaxed when I played. So I think you got to be careful. You don't make too much out of it. Um, but, uh, you know, I said, I, I think they've done a good job with that so far this year, just kind of keeping an even keel and preparing for every game the same way. Now, being this close to the team again, uh, because Nittany game week, I, I believe, yeah. is, you know, th this is year one. It's just a couple months old. Um, yeah. how, what does that do for the, that coaching bug inside of you? Does this inch you closer to really wanting to be on the field again? Or, or are you comfortable just talking about what's going on? <laughs> I can tell you this, it's a lot easier to just talk about what's going on than have to be ready, you know, sit up there and the you know, 40 second clock's running and they go, hey, what are we going to run next? Um, but I miss that tremendously. But the good thing about the Nitty Game Week show, I, I had done a show for a couple of years previous called Blue White Tailgate uh, and that station got sold. So uh, I called Tom Bradley, who I coached with for a number of years at Penn State and said, hey, let's do a show. And we do a five six minute segment every week where we break of the half hour show we literally break down these are four things you gotta look for on iowa's offense four things you gotta look for on iowa's defense and it gets us kind of looking at film and evaluating certain things and uh so it does kind of keep that coaching thing going um so that part of it's been a lot of fun but you're not jumping out of your seat to put the headset on oh i look if somebody called tomorrow yeah i mean no question about it um, part of the things that have happened with what happened 10 years ago, there's been some hesitancy among, among some people to, 
you know, bring someone in that was at Penn State at that time, whatever the case may be. Um, and I understand that. And, uh, you know, I've had some conversations here and there, but, you know, you have to weigh also um, what it does for your family. Uh, you know, with, with five kids and uh, you can't just root, uproot them and move them, you know, somewhere to do that. I mean, you have to have a, that's a family decision, not just me alone. Oh, of course. Um, yeah. But, you know, as you've alluded to now, basically about a, a decade or so, you've been doing stuff outside of being a coach. Um, very much near the game, but I also want to point out for anyone that's not aware, uh, you've written two uh, incredibly, uh, two incredible books, rather, uh, the first of which, The Paternal Legacy, the second of which, a novel that came out last year, um, The Hot Seat, A Year Inside Football's Pressure Cooker. Uh, you're president of Blue Line 409. Uh, you've been doing consulting. So how have you managed just figuring out what you wanted to do outside of being so close to football? I'd have to imagine, in a way, it's a uh, it was a rebirth of sorts of, of rediscovering what you wanted to do. No doubt. I mean, I, I've always had um, a lot of outside interests other than football. I love football. I mean, you put me on a chalkboard and I could be there for, I'm showing how old I am by referencing chalk, but a dry erase board or whatever you want to, you know, whatever we're using these days, uh, iPads, that kind of stuff. I'll draw a place for days. Love the back and forth. You know, one of the, the fun thing about doing this show, the game with Tom Bradley is we'll get in the car because the studio's, about an, uh, about an hour and a half from State College from the station where we shoot it. And he and I just yap football the whole way down, talk about pass protection. He's always picking my brain on pass protection stuff and coverage. He's talking about coverage. So that part of it is, is there. But um, the reality is that, you know, you have to um, adjust to things. So in life, you know, I, I started writing, always been writing even while I was coaching. That was kind of a hobby I had. I don't golf. Um, I didn't start fly fishing until after I was done coaching. So some of these other hobbies I've accrued since then um, weren't there. So I would write and, and I always felt, I always read a lot, um, got involved in some political campaigns. I was a surrogate speaker for the Obama campaign in 08 and, and 12. Um, so a lot of different, so I knew there was a, I had other interests and other opportunities. To, so they arose. So you just kind of have to evaluate, but you know, every day you wake up and say, okay, I've got to handle this with the startup that I'm involved with, this with the show, uh, this with the consulting I'm doing, some of the name, image, and likeness stuff, um, all these different things you got to, it's all in a big pot. You got to make sure you're organized so that you do things in a timely fashion. And you have to be willing to say, I don't have to do this, even if you want to work on, say, a, a name, image, likeness thing. Well, I got the show tapes on this day, so I've got to make sure I handle this before that. Then, you know, it's just, it's constant time management now. Yeah, absolutely a juggling act. Uh, but but the name image likeness, uh, to, to me, it, it, it's so crazy because it just feels like the Wild West abruptly started one day and you have kids signing with sponsors or whomever, um, but no one really knows, you know, what sort, of, uh, what sort of rules should be in place for what you're signing off. What type of rights did you just sign away? You know, what what are the, the boundaries that uh, these kids should be aware of? Uh, so for me, as much as it was a great sign, I think, for college athletes to be able to capitalize on NIL, um, for there to be such limited guidelines on, on what makes sense and what are good business practices for both the sponsors and the athletes, it, it leaves room for kids to really be taken advantage of. So since you, you do consulting in this space, I'd love to hear just your, your general thoughts about how things have evolved and what you see for the landscape. Well, two years ago when California passed this law, I, you know, I was already on the board of trustees and we had a trustee meeting and some trustees asked about it. And, uh, you know, the president of the university and the athletic director basically talked about, you know, this will be car dealerships will put players on billboards. And I said, you guys left a whole bunch of stuff out. Uh, it's going to be, you know, guys, say a guy like Saquon Barkley who's still at Penn State right now. I said, I said to him, I said, what do you think people would pay for him to crash their wedding? or a Sweet 16 birthday party, or a lobbying firm would pay to have him show up in the state capitol and, and, or at a, at a reception to, to lobby Penn State alums or the state legislature. I said, now, take that to a city like Columbus, where they're in the state capitol, or Madison, Wisconsin, or Tallahassee, or Austin, Texas. I said, there's so many things. And the NCAA just kind of threw their hands up and said, we're waiting for federal legislation. And Anybody that follows politics know waiting for Congress to get something done is probably not your best bet, um, especially when they have a lot of other things that are more important than this. So the NCAA just kind of let events overtake them. There was no leadership whatsoever. So it did create, just like you referenced, the Wild West, 
where kids can get taken advantage of. And uh, the group that, that brought me as a consultant, we talked about these things. We talked about athletes needing AAA. Uh, you know, your high-profile athletes going to need AAA as in an accountant, an attorney, and an agent. Because you better have somebody, you know, if this company comes to you or some promoter comes to you and says, we want you to come to this event. Well, what if this promoter is not legit? What if this promoter is getting you into something that could end up in litigation? So, um, you know, I think that it's a patchwork right now. Every state is different. States that don't have laws, the schools make their own rules. And there does not to be, seem to be any, if you run afoul of the rules, there does not seem to be anyone in one section enforce what rules there are. And as I told the board of trustees and I've told people in, in other schools and ADs I've talked to, you know, you got to remember this. Coaches spend our entire, doesn't matter, basketball, football, baseball, you name it. Every coach is trying to find the loophole. Whether it's a game plan, whether it's recruiting, whatever it is, I said, there are no loopholes here because there's no loop. It's just whatever happens, happens. So it's, uh, it's a really interesting time in college athletics, no doubt. Now, I think it was Bryce Young, Alabama's quarterback, that Nick Saban basically said seven-figure deal out of the gate. This kid's you know, 17, 18 years old, um, and, and I'm blanking on the name. The Ohio, Ohio uh, State. Um, uh, oh, the uh, the kid from Texas that left school yes. early. Yeah, what is his name now? I'm drawing a blank. I, I want to say, um, yeah, I, I would guess something and then make myself look stupid, so nah, I'm not going to hazard guess. About, yeah. But how do you just – Fast forward a couple of years, if there's no real hard legislation or uh, guidelines in place, do you think that we see more of that in you know, basically having teenagers given large sums of money that it could ultimately damage the product of college football? And that could potentially, you know, if these kids are sort of getting off the rails so early, maybe they don't become the NFL players that they should have been because they got too much money, they weren't dedicated, and it never really comes together. Is that part of any of the conversations that you're having? Oh, no question about it. I mean, it's, I think right now there's, 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 uh, you know, everybody's rushing in, you know, uh, Dr. Pepper put the uh, Clemson quarterback on the commercial, and now Clemson's out of the top 25. He's not playing particularly well, and they're probably probably regretting that one um you know and i think that's i think there's gonna everybody's rushing i think it's going to settle down to where companies that are going to put that kind of money into athletes can start to say wait let's 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 make sure we have a general gauge on what kind of performance we can expect from these guys before we just hand them money um you know given a high school senior that kind of money um you know when you look at these five-star and four-star recruits they're about 50 50 i mean when you look at how they produce um, and there's going to be, so people are going to be, the, ultimately companies are going to want return on investment. However, on the flip side, you're going to have boosters that are involved because they're allowed to be involved. So you're going to have schools that this is going to become a recruiting thing. This is going to be that high school kid. Hey, come to school A because we're going to get you um, X amount, of, you know, there's going to be this amount of money of endorsement. Now, by law and by rules, schools can't be involved in that and coaches can't arrange that. Um, but, you know, I mean, that's not, it doesn't take a genius if you're an Alabama fan, you know who they're recruiting or a Penn State fan, you know, who's being recruited. Um, and, you know, we've had this discussion and I, you know, I, I said to people now, because we, we are kind of on the tail end of this facilities arms race where people are spending all kinds of money in facilities. So the facilities with NIL, and I said this to the board back in February, uh, publicly, I said the NIL arms race is over. I mean, excuse me, the, the facilities arms race is over. It's NIL now. Because I don't care how good your weight room is, if Penn State's recruiting a kid and we've got the best weight room in the country, he's going to make a hundred grand in NIL, um, and he can go to say Texas, who may not have as good a weight room or facilities we have, and he can get a million two, because he's in Austin, it's a bigger city, and there's a lot of Fortune 500 companies there. Um, I think the whole family's probably going to move to Austin, Texas. I mean, it's just what it is. And, you know, it's that, that's going to be part of it. And you mentioned back in February that, that conversation, you, ultimately you did get some blowback about uh, taking a stance on you know, should money be spent on upgrading facilities. Were you at all surprised about uh, how some of, some of the negative reaction that you got for taking a stance like that? Well, some, the negative reaction was pretty narrow. It was. Um, the, yeah, yeah. I, if I showed you emails and letters and all kinds of correspondence overwhelmingly, 
in favor of what I did, partly because one of the stance I took was like, look, in the middle of COVID, and you know, February, we didn't know if we we're gonna have full stadium. We didn't, and 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 we had last year, um, we we basically kept people season ticket money and said you have the option to either you know donate it or roll it over. Um, and 90% of them rolled it over. So there's a 27, $28 million hole that, yeah, we got the money last year, but we're not getting it this year. So how are you going to pay for all this? Um, you know, and it, it, so that was part of the thinking as well as given all the things we were dealing with the university, laying off employees, furloughing workers, you know, teaching remotely. I just felt like, you know, if we waited eight or nine months to start, it wasn't going to be the end of the world. If the program was that fragile, that an eight or nine month or a year delay in doing the building was going to make or break the program that we really didn't have the program we think we had. So, you know, the blowback didn't, you know, there was, there was some, a couple of vocal former ex players that, you know, challenged, questioned my uh, integrity, questioned my uh, intentions, but my intentions were to do what was best for Penn state university. Imagine that one thing comes up and all of a sudden a body of work about integrity and questions come <laughs> up as if somehow. Um, exactly. So you know, that being said, though, you know, I, I did just want to ask you a, a little bit about your father. And, and I told you before we started, I have uh, the utmost respect for everything that he accomplished. He's one of the greatest coaches of all time. And, you know, it, it's been almost a decade, as you've already said. How do you feel about, you know, a lot of what I seen when, when you were speaking publicly, it was in 2012, 2014. It, so in the time since then, the, the dust has settled a little bit more. I'm not saying it's completely settled by any means, but how do you feel that the Penn State community has done in 10 years um, since then? Well, I think there's a, even 10 years later, there's a little bit, uh, I think one of the biggest mistakes the Penn State administration made in, in 12 um, is, you know, the free report obviously was completely fictional. Um, Joe was cleared by everybody that investigated the situation. He was actually commended for, you know, reporting exactly the way he was supposed to those kind of things. But the free report went the other way and the university didn't back Joe and he has yet to really acknowledge that history and everything. So I think for a lot of fans that are older, that's still kind of a, that's still one of those things that still, there's no closure there. You know, had, when, when Joe announced his retirement, had Joe coached the Nebraska, they'd not fired him. And he coached Nebraska game. I think you'd have a very different sense of closure in that people would have been able to go to the stadium and say, thank you. And watch him walk off the field one time, they would have had that. And then unfortunately, you know, he died within two months. So there has not been that moment where the people in the stadium, you know, even the next fall, there was no, no acknowledgement of Joe in the stadium, nothing. Like when you look at what's happened with Bobby Bowden and some other people. Um, not that they should or didn't, and I'm not saying they have to or whatever. I'm just saying from somebody who understands the psychology of people, um, there hasn't been that closure. And I still get stopped by people um, who are tears in their eyes saying, you know, I, and, and, you know, taking the statue, all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think so that's still fetch. I think with younger people, it's not as, as important, um, partly because they didn't live through that era. It's not really their history. Um, whereas with older people, that's a big chunk of their life's history and something that they're a part of, they feel like should be honored. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things that we'll get to eventually um, and that'll be good. But I think the Penn State community still has that kind of there. Um, but I think, you know, I get Google alerts almost every day for Joe Paterno. And, you know, I always click on them just to see, you know, does this person who wrote whatever it is feel the need to always qualify Joe's career or life with but this, and you're seeing less and less of that now. I think it's fading more and more into, into people's memory. Now, uh, I want to credit you because you do, from everything I've seen, you do such a tremendous job of speaking very professionally, almost third party about Penn State and you know your father as if he was just a coach or someone you knew. So I, I do just want to ask you as a, as a son, how hard was it to see what was going on with your family during that time and how... Uh, per usual in the media, immediate conclusions were jumped to, and it was sort of, um, there was no fairness, there was no let's wait and see, it was just sort of uh, a, a Salem witch trial of sorts from the jump without ever really caring about getting into the details. Just a, a, as a son, how hard was that for you to, to see all that happening and knowing that there's very little you'd be able to do to actually help the situation? 
Well, it was frustrating because you knew the truth. I mean, you knew, you know, for somebody to imply that my dad would be involved in a cover up when, you know, you're ignoring, you know, 61 years of professional integrity and honesty. And you, you know, we've come to a place in society where we will readily accept the absolute worst allegation about anybody we don't like without proof. And yet when it's somebody we do like, we demand absolute proof. So, I mean, it's, we're inconsistent as a society that way. Um, Joe was obviously, when you really look at the history of this, this was a two or three year grand jury investigation into these crimes. Joe was in the grand jury for six minutes. He was a complete tangent to this case from a legal standpoint. Now, once the media got involved um, and Penn State's administration absolutely botched the handling of that story once it broke, because, you know, if you look at Syracuse basketball, there was an allegation with them about two or three months of, of the Penn State stuff about an assistant coach who was on Jim Beheim's staff at the time. And they handled it much differently. And Jim Beheim is still the coach at Syracuse. Not that he shouldn't be. I, I don't want to imply that. But I'm just saying, if you look at the way the two things were handled. So it was very frustrating because you never felt like you could get ahead of it. Yet I had to continually maintain a professional presence about it and be patient externally. But yeah, if I told you there wasn't sometimes at home where you wanted to scream, you know, go out the back door and just scream your head off or, you know, just snap on a reporter who was asking sure. dumb questions. Um, yeah, that's all in the back of my mind, but luckily I've got this fence that keeps those things from getting over and getting out of my mouth. So, I mean, yeah, it's, uh, and I think that's, uh, I learned a lot of patience from, from coaching and, and dealing with media for so many years. And that's obviously something that a lifetime of experience you were able to accumulate to help you be equipped to deal with that. But if I could flip my question just slightly and ask, you know, you as a father, how have you managed trying to protect your children as they're going to be bombarded with information and opinions, mostly opinions, not information right. on who their grandfather was? Um, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book was I felt like I wanted to get that on record. So when I sat down and wrote, wrote Paternal Legacy, um, I also realized that uh, I wrote that with the idea that I wanted, it wasn't just for, for people to read, I wanted this on record for my kids, my nieces and nephews, my brothers and sisters, my mom, and then everybody going forward have this record of what it was really like and what I learned from him and what impact he had on other people. That being said, you talk about how I handled as a father. Um, I readily admit that I, I really did a horrible job. Um, when this thing all happened, I was so wrapped up in finishing the season as a coach, dealing with all these other things, and then dealing with the death of my dad, which was such a public thing. And, you know, 50,000 people came through the viewing. You know, 12, 13,000 people were at the memorial service, and I had to give a speech at the end of it. Um, you know, there were all these things. And then after that, there was so much correspondence and you're writing to people who have written you notes and people all over the country and emails and messages that until I sat down and really wrote the book, I didn't realize, A, I had never really grieved about this the way I should have and dealt with it. And B, that I had kind of left a lot of the tough stuff to my wife, Kelly. And, uh, you know, in the dedication of the book, I basically, the first person I dedicated the book to was her and just, you know, how she stuck with me. Um, a lot of these situations ended up in divorce um, because of the stress. And she stuck with me and did a great job with my kids because they did get a little off the rails in terms of some school things. And she was the one that was right there doing it. So I give her all the credit on that. And thank you. I appreciate the, the, the candor on opening up uh, on all that. Cause I'm sure it was incredibly difficult. Um, but, so I, I did want to ask about the book, but you mentioned it. You know, I, I'd imagine there's a great sense of um, duty on some level to, to try to put out um, something on behalf of, of your family. So I, I thought that that just that move in and of itself was tremendous. Uh, I did just want to add a little bit about working you know, with, with your father. Um, I don't, you know, if you're Tom Brady Jr. or Michael Jordan Jr., it's going to be tough getting out of the legacy of your father. And certainly when your father's Joe Paterno, it's going to be difficult as well because it's a massive shadow that's cast for everything that he was. Has that, do you ever think about that? And has that ever carried any weight in terms of decision-making on what you wanted to do in, in terms of your career and being your own person? Well, you know, after I was at Penn State for a while, I thought, you know, I had some people call me about, would you be interested in this job or that job, you know, over the years. 
And once I got to a certain point where I knew the end of his career was was within two, you know, of course, that was for 10 years. It was, you know, three to five more years, three to five more years. He kept kind of kicking the goalposts, moving the goalposts and everybody. But, you know, I, I did knew at that point, look, it may not be the best thing for my career, but I want to be here when he's done. You know, if I were coaching somewhere else and the last game he's coaching, you know, I'm somewhere else coaching I, that I would never forgive myself for that. Um, and I, you know, and I felt like, you know, you know, as long as I was in the room, there was somebody, you know, when you get to be that age and coaching um, and we get to, to where the end is in sight, there's a lot of people kind of positioning. And sometimes you don't have a hundred percent loyalty from some guys, not that that was the case at Penn state, but I just felt like, you know, he needed someone in the room who would tell him the truth all the time. And it what didn't always go well. <laughs> you know, occasionally, ah, oh, you, you're so cynical. How do you get so cynical when you're so young? And why you know, but you know, there was there was that going on. But I but I think that was, you know, no doubt I could have done some things differently um and gone elsewhere. But you know, I just felt like, you know, at some point you got to be your own person, but you also have to understand no matter what you do, um, when whether you're, you know, Derek Jeter, if he's got a son or whoever it may be, you know, you mentioned Michael Jordan Jr. or you know, other guys that are coaching, uh, Bill Belichick's son's a defense coordinator. You know, you're your own person, but people are always going to see part of them in you. Um, you know, when I go to games and, and I'm out tailgating, people stop me and they want to talk about Joe and they want to get pictures taken. And, you know, and, and a friend of mine said, that must be, you know, that must be really cool. I said, look, you know, part of it is that it's, they're really, it's a part of him they want, not necessarily what anything I've done. Um, and I remember watching a documentary on Bobby Kennedy when he was campaigning and there was all these crowds and someone said, look at all these crowds. He said, yeah, but they're also here to see him. Um, and I thought that was a really striking statement. It really hit home. And, I under, and, I, I, and I'm mature enough to understand that. So when you think back, uh, all the, the moments of, you know, coaching alongside your father, is it even possible to put your finger on one, two, a, a couple different of cornerstones or, or ethos that really summed up what he thought were the most important aspects of, you know, having a good locker room of, of how to coach, how to conduct yourself, you know, things that like, as you reflect on are, are you know, you really carry with you. Oh, there's one thing that sticks out above all. And it really is the foundation of what his program was about. And this would have been 97, 98, maybe um, we would walk home from games after games. And it's, when I was on a team, we would, I would, I would, he and I would walk back to the house because I was in college and then there was free food there. So, I mean, it wasn't necessarily that I loved my dad. It was like, I'm hungry. Um, but we had, we started to talk and then I left for five years and came back and I said, Hey, we got to start walking home again. He goes, Hey, it may surprise you to know that I was able to find my way home for five years while you were gone. Um, but so we walked home. So one day we're walking home and I was talking about a kid I'd recruited. It was, it was a good player, but not the kind of player. He came with a lot of accolades didn't quite hadn't yet in the sophomore year kind of gotten where we thought he would and I made that comment and he said Jay let me he said just cut it out he said let me tell you one thing he said you know you don't have kids yet but when you do you'll understand this as a parent you're only as happy as your least happy child he said every guy we bring in here was raised by two parents maybe it's just a mother maybe it's a grandmother maybe it is of uncle, whatever it is, but somebody put a lot of time and effort into that young man's life. And our obligation is to make sure that when they leave Penn State, that they come out of here happier than when they came in. And we said, what I mean by that is, you know, are they a better person? Are they prepared for life? Have they got the education? So yeah, maybe he's not as good a football player as you thought he was going to be, or we thought he was going to be. That's on us. We got to make him a better football player. We got to find a way to, to help him. But we also have to understand we our first obligation to make sure they get educated, make sure that, you know, when they call home, they feel like they're being treated fairly. They're getting the education, they're getting the things out of Penn State they want. And that's really the foundation for the whole was for the whole program. I mean, every guy that came in with a problem, Joe looked at through that lens. And uh, that was, you know, after I had kids, it really became crystal clear to me that that's exactly right. And, um, you know, it wasn't about how much money we're going to make. It wasn't about getting more facilities or salaries. It was about the guys that we coached and, and, and their lives, not just what they did on the field. Doesn't that hit the nail right on the head? Um, you know, Jay, in closing, I'd like to ask you a couple quick questions. It's called the gauntlet. So I hope you're ready for these hard questions. Uh, well, you know, they, we used to have a gauntlet, you know, the, these, these gauntlets that guys would run through with the ball. 
Oh, that's where and, I took the name. Stole it. Right. So, so the quarterbacks were talking. They had a couple of fumbles, and they, I said, "Look, we're going to take you guys to the gauntlet." Like, oh, we're going to. I said, "Give me the damn ball." And I went through the gauntlet without pads on. And every time we did it, I would go through without pads. But okay, I don't want to hear any complaining, guys. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm ready for the gauntlet. Man, this won't be as hard as that, I can assure you. So, uh, what's most important, having the number one offense or the number one defense? Number one defense, and I think you're looking seeing that right now with Alabama, Georgia, Penn State. Iowa and Cincinnati. Definitely. Now, what's most important? Is it the players or is it the scheme? Players without question. I figured. And like that said, you got to be able to adjust your scheme to what the players, with the players that you have. Yeah. Oh, cl clearly it's a mix and I, it's an unfair yep. question. Uh, you're no, no, it's no. I mean, look, you can, you can draw up any play you want. I can't make that throw. <laughs> if you can't make the throw, you can't make the throw. That's right. Um, now, pregame, any ritual that you had, um, whether it was a, as a player or a coach? Not really. I mean, like home games, I would park, park my car at my parents' house uh, and walk up to the office and then over to the stadium, and I'd walk home from the game, but nothing really, nothing. I, I wasn't superstitious like that. Got it. Now, now my dad had two hot dogs before every game. <laughs> now, they had two hot dogs in his locker in Ohio State one year that was one that got him really he had to he had to run across the field during the middle of the game because whatever was in that hot dog somebody had laced it not <laughs> actually but you know that was our theory now th th there's so many memories i'm sure but is there one memory that really jumps out as being a favorite football memory for you not really but i but i think the the, the 400th win was was significant and meaningful because it was you know, it was one of those nights where, you know, we got down 21 nothing. Um, <laughs> we beat Michigan for 399. Um, I said to my mom, hey, is my, my sister Diane was in town. I said, she coming back for next week. My mom said, why? I said, what's well, the 400th win coming up if we win? And my mom said, oh, is that a big deal? I go, yeah, it's pretty big, mom. And uh, so she said, well, you got to talk to your sister. So she comes over. I said, look, they're going to do some after the game for dad. We're going to win because, well, I'm not coming up here if we're not going to win. I said, oh, I guarantee we're going to win. And we were down 21 nothing with less than a minute to go in the first half. And I'm going, oh, my God, she is so going to kill me. And we went 92 yards and 40-something seconds and scored and scored the next four drives and won the game 35-21. But after the game, it was just, it was just electric and magical. And it was um, that image of that after that game will stick with me. But certainly there's so many other great games and moments. Of course. Uh, well, in closing, uh, the last question I have for you is, given everything you've been able to accomplish, whether it's as a coach you know, in the last 10 years, uh, not coaching, pursuing other endeavors, what's the one best piece of advice that you could leave this on for uh, achieving success? Oh, geez, that's a tough one. Um, I think the biggest thing that's, uh, that's prepared me for life was, is what we call the blue line. And... Um, we had a blue line across the practice field. So every time you walked on that field, you crossed a physical blue line. And Joe, you say, look, when you cross this blue line, you can't do anything about a girlfriend or a test you bombed or uh, something going on at home. You got to come into this practice and the next two hours, you've got to focus on nothing but getting better and learning what you're supposed to do. He said, but that being said, when you walk into a classroom, you got to imagine there's a blue line there and you've got to be completely into what is going on because the only thing you can do about anything about right then is your physics class, your math class, whatever it is. And they said, when you go home, um, you know, be there when it's time for you to spend time with your family, put a blue line there and block everything else out. And so that advice um, in coaching certainly helped uh, when all the things happened 10 years ago, trying to focus on the things that mattered while all this other noise was going on. That advice helped when I sit down to write. You know, I cross the blue line in my office mentally and sit down and handle that when I'm on a conference call. You know, everybody on conference calls starts to drift and they're texting friends while somebody, but you got to stay focused. So, I mean, no matter what it is, that blue line has been something that's carried me through so many things in life. That's awesome. I, I love it. Jay, thank you so much for taking the time this morning. Uh, for everyone, it's Nittany Game Week. If you want to watch Jay week to week with the, the Penn State football team, jvpaterno.com i know you're on twitter you're on instagram is yep. there any other place uh that we should have our audience go <laughs> um yeah you mentioned the website nittanygameweek.com if, if 
if you're not in the network, because we're in nine markets in that reach parts of eight states. Um, if you're not in that network, the show goes up on Saturday morning as well. So if they want to watch the whole show, they can go to nittygameweek.com. There's a bunch of other fun stuff there too. All right. All kinds all of good bio. Oh yeah. yeah. A busy man. So I, I appreciate you squeezing me in. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jay. Oh, I had fun, Steve. I really enjoyed it.